This is Adashina Koike, and you're listening to the A Lot of Sports Talk podcast, as well as joining us on our Facebook live stream. If you cover sports long enough as a journalist, you will be able to come across a lot of people who are amazing personalities, wonderful characters, and beacons of inspiration. And my guest right now on the A Lot of Sports Talk podcast is all that uh, wrapped up into one. A lot of people... Uh, were made aware in the hockey world and outside of the hockey world about this amazing, amazing man uh, who is a wonderful family man, a great uh, assistant general manager, and a lot of people were made aware of his story as a lot of publications have talked about him, his wife, and his family's daily life after his uh, diagnosis of Lou Gehrig's disease last year. Um, Our familiarity with him goes back almost 20 years to the day I first stepped on campus at Syracuse University. He was an inspiration then and continues to be an inspiration to this day. Joining us on the A Lot of Sports Talk podcast, the assistant general manager of the Calgary Flames and free agent place kicker. Chris Snow. <laughs> he joins us on the A Lot of Sports Talk podcast. First of all, Chris, thank you so very much uh, for joining us. And uh, the reason why I mentioned the uh, free agent place kicker is because um, uh, on a tweet uh, that you sent out uh, last month, uh, you kicked, I believe, a 43-yard field goal uh, and tweeted that out uh as a way to help fundraise uh, for ALS through the Calgary Flames uh, website. How long have you continued your um, hobby of kicking field goals after our time at Syracuse? Well, to begin with, Adesina, that is about the nicest introduction I have ever had. And uh, I might need that taped and condensed sent back to me (laughs) as a, uh, just a real confidence booster anytime I need it because that was the greatest uh, and you're right, you and I go back two decades. Uh, you were easily the uh, smiliest and uh, most outgoing resident on that floor that I was the RA for. And uh, those four to five months before I left for the school paper were four to five of the most uh, just enjoyable months I had at Syracuse. So thank you for that. Uh, as for that kick you referenced, we began in the month of June, which is ALS Awareness Month here in Canada what we called a uh, trick shot for snowy. And the idea was much like the ice bucket challenge, find a way uh, incorporating some fun and creativity to fundraise. And our fundraising goes back to December when I announced my diagnosis. But in June, we wanted something to reinvigorate that fundraising at a time in the year when with COVID and job loss and job cutbacks, people have not had really money to donate and we hadn't uh, really been asking uh, for people to donate. And so that campaign has been and is continuing to be a great one. And uh, my second trick shot was to, on the one year anniversary of my diagnosis, a day in which I was given one year to live, uh, was to kick a 43 yard field goal and my, my kids were running through the grass just shrieking and excited. and. That does go back to Syracuse. When I was there my my third and fourth year, I lived directly across the street from the practice facility for the football team. And there was a tall fence where they left the lights on at night. And a buddy of mine and I would jump that fence and play horse, but field goal kicking. So we'd say, okay, 37 yards left hash. And you hit that and the other guy to match it and so on and so forth. So I hadn't done that in probably... 15 years, uh, but right away I realized it's muscle memory and I was thrilled to be able to do it. (laughs) Um, You may not remember this. You may not remember this, uh, but um, I was your holder at (laughs) one point. And if I get this correctly, I think it was a 47-yard field goal uh, that you made is impeccable because I got to be honest and I feel bad. I forgot about the hold, but uh, 47 was the record. I can remember which end zone it was to. It was off the ground. I thought there was one of those plastic kind of finger holders. It was actually you. Uh, so that's my bad, but uh, gosh, that's a great memory to think back about. 
to know you were part of it. Uh, so you hunted, there was no dropping the ball with you. No, all right, and I didn't have to. It was a perfect snap. There was none. Um, yeah. but able to <laughs> lace his out. <laughs> Pull. We coordinate all that. <laughs> all right. So, yes, uh, on the record, and it did happen, I want to say 2002 or 2003, uh, a 47-yard field goal Chris Snow did make off of my hold. That did happen. I've got a witness. Okay. <laughs> right? Um, you mentioned uh, the uh, diagnosis of ALS, Luke Gehrig's disease, at uh, at last year in June, June 17th uh, of right. last year. Uh, there are a lot of people who can relate to either themselves or family members or close friends uh, dealing uh, with situations where they've been diagnosed with uh, either you know, disease, cancer, just illness, um, and have to deal with day-to-day -day living. Uh, when you wake up every day, um, I know it's been you know over a year since, and you got the timeline back last year uh, where it was more than possible that you wouldn't be with us at this point today. Uh, when you wake up um, every day, uh, I guess, what's your prevailing thought the second you wake up? Yeah, that, that's a really well phrased question. I think the initial thought is, well, you're forgotten, right? When you go to bed, you kind of park whatever thoughts, good or bad, that you have. And when you wake up for a minute, you know, you have forgotten about it. And then it kind of kicks in, and there's that initial feeling of, oh, you know, that, that is still reality. And then the next feeling is one of being sure that every moment of the day I maximize, and one of gratitude. And, and on certain days, it certainly is easier than others. I find that this time of year in the summer, when I'm on my bike a lot with the kids, playing baseball in the field, playing football, playing street hockey, those moments I am reinforced or it is reinforced to me that I am very healthy, you know, that I have no issue with participating in almost anything I want to athletically, no issues of breathing, speaking, those things are uh, really reinforced when I'm moving and doing things with, with my kids or with others. And so I think uh, that is the sentiment that I try to carry through the day. And if, if, if there's a difficulty in the day, it's it's fear, it's anxiety, it's checking your body to see if anything else is indicating that, you know, there's a little bit of progression somewhere. And I think as long as I move quickly beyond and out of those thoughts, um, my days at this point in time are, are good and very manageable. Uh, for these past uh, 13 months, um I'm sure there have been good days. I'm sure there have been not so good days. I'm sure there have been days where you and uh, your wonderful wife, Kelsey, and your two children have had um, conversations. Um, how honest um, have those conversations been, especially uh, uh, with your two young children? Right, right. That, that's a great question. I, I think with them, what we were told early on was to be honest with them, but not to tell them more than they needed to know. And my son is older, he's going to be nine next month, and he has more awareness than my daughter, who will be six in September. And what, what has been wonderful for us is that while my son realizes that this took my dad, and that is recent, that was two years ago, this summer, he, he sees, as we see, this medication that I'm on as making my situation entirely different from my dad's. And he's also seen, as my daughter has me continue to coach his hockey team, play catch. Um, I've kind of done the gym habit, and I throw left-handed now and put that glove on my right hand that was my dominant hand, and then switch um, in order to catch the ball. And so I, I don't. He, he doesn't bring up you know scary questions. He doesn't seem to have anxiety about how bad this could potentially get. And that's been just just wonderful for me and my wife because when I initially went in to be diagnosed, the worst fear is having to tell your your child or children a, a story of no hope. And that is not the story that we told. That's not the story that I'm living. And every single day that we put between June 17th of last year and the day I'm living reinforces to me and them that 
you know, that that's not going to be a story, I hope, that we're telling anytime soon. And, and as for my wife, you know, we we have periods where I think she or I feel a little bit more down just because you go through that cycle. And on those days, we'll talk about it. But I don't want to worry her excessively. You know, so it's a balancing act of being honest about what I'm thinking and feeling, but not drawing worry out of her at a time when really we don't need to worry today. There may be a day when we need to worry, but that day isn't today and that day probably is not tomorrow. Uh, once again, Chris Snow, the Assistant General Manager of the Calgary Flames, joining us on the A Lot of Sports Talk podcast. Uh, you mentioned the uh, drug uh, that you're on, uh, that your dad, who is a wonderful uh, writer in Boston, uh, Bob Snow, yeah. who uh, uh, passed away a couple of years ago, uh, as you said. And I got to meet him, I think, right around the time uh, that you were getting ready, ready to graduate or when you visited uh, Syracuse. Wonderful person. So I'm more than thankful to have gotten the chance to meet him. You. Um, you mentioned uh, the drug uh, that you're cur- currently on. It's, it's I, I believe it's in kind of an experimental or trial uh, basis yeah. uh, treatment uh, that that is a uh, tofersin. Uh, I might be yeah. pronouncing that uh, incorrectly. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, how were you first introduced uh, to uh, this drug, and were there reservations about taking it initially and uh what were those moments like when you met when you heard that there was this kind of experimental trial treatment uh that might be available and could be available for you and i guess compare life before uh that treatment uh to after sure there was a week prior to my diagnosis when I was preliminarily diagnosed here in Calgary and that was by someone who was not an ALS specialist so I then went to see one and in that week my wife being who she is dove in on research into any drugs clinical trials any form of potential hope and so when we went down to Miami to be diagnosed she had in her bag information about two clinical trials that seemed promising and this ultimately was one of them and the the great part was that as soon as the doctor in Miami diagnosed me he said I asked what to do and he said well two things one do do what brings you joy and two you have to join this clinical trial it is the most promising thing I have seen and it applies to the specific genetic cause that you have and he was literally texting the doctor, the lead neurologist, basically in Canada, but he happens to be in Toronto, um, okay. as, as I sat there. So um, basically, I, was, I had a spot as soon as within minutes of, of being diagnosed where uh, a note was sent back from the doctor in Toronto saying, yep, yeah, we have a spot. And because the people in Miami had visited with my dad and a cousin of mine before for research purposes, they knew what they were dealing with with me, and they were able to fast track that um, enrollment visit, which I did one week, uh, seven, eight, nine days later in Toronto, going to the NHL draft between that diagnosis date and that enrollment date. And and as soon as I walked into that office in Toronto, the doctor there, Lauren Zinman, he said, um, he said, we don't get people as healthy as you in here, and we are here to make history. And he just gave me this this amount of confidence and belief where when I walked out of that office enrolled and prepared to come back monthly thereafter, you know, I was I was crying tears of of happiness because I had never envisioned coaching my son's hockey team this past year. And all of a sudden I said, I might do that. I might do things that I thought I would not be able to do again. And as each month passed, we became more and more convinced that I had gotten the real thing because there was a one in three chance I would get a placebo and need to wait six to seven months to get the real thing. Uh, And over those six to seven months, perhaps travel back and forth and be getting worse and, uh, you know, be getting a spinal tap every month for, you know, for nothing, not nothing, because at the end of it, I would have gotten the real thing. But I think the deterioration I would have seen would have been pretty significant. Uh, you mentioned the 
uh, hope and belief that uh, was boosted uh, after you uh, talked to the doctor about this uh, trial uh, treatment and the boost that you got and being able to think that you might be able to coach your son's hockey team uh, in the near future, which you have done which you will continue to do, uh, I believe. <laughs> okay, that's the plan, which you continue to do. Um, you have mentioned uh, and reading about uh, some of the stories that have been written uh, that you've said, you know, you've already beaten the odds and now you want to really uh, beat the odds. Uh, what does really beating the odds mean to you? Well, I think it means being the first or one of the first people to live with this disease, you know, to beat this disease. Um, there is more funding going into ALS research and clinical trials now than ever before by a wide margin. Um, there are more people who are advocating and pushing the government on uh, granting greater accessibility to trials than ever before. And it, it feels, and, and a little bit is a hopefulness, but it feels like there is a tipping point that we're approaching where this disease will be understood and these trials will begin to have success. And when you see doctors who for two to three decades have devoted their careers to this and have basically diagnosed people and then sent them home to die, uh, and you see genuine hope uh, and belief in those people that this is this is real, that what I'm on could be it, like capital I, capital T, uh, and then similar approaches to, to gene therapy or to other natures of dealing with the disease, uh, as, as those come, I think this is going to be, in the not terribly distant future, a disease that is treatable. And my like my wife often says, she says, you, you don't need this drug to be it necessarily. But as long as it buys us time, she thinks something else will come along if this isn't it. So it, I think the answer to your question is, you know, measured measured in decades, not years, um, and hopefully lots of them. You know, I, I had a doctor tell me this is a lifetime drug for you. And he says, when I say that, I mean a long lifetime, like giving this to you for 30, 40, 50 years. And whenever I get down or fearful, I think back on what he said to me that day, and that's coming from a leading expert, and that gives me a great deal of hope. Uh, I don't doubt that this 20-year reunion we're having right now uh, will be a 40-year reunion uh, in 20 years. Yeah, on the show, for sure. <laughs> All right. I, we Thank you. All right. So um, we already have a guest planned, uh, booked for uh, 2040. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have to talk about uh, kind of the day-to-day uh, -day things uh, that your job uh, entails, uh, being the assistant general manager of a professional national hockey league team uh, that's getting ready for a qualifying round uh, to uh, make it, to try and make it into the Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, so how, especially now with uh, the interruption of the league and many leagues uh, with COVID-19, uh, obviously preparations for the draft, for making it into the playoffs because uh, you guys were in a tight uh, race in the Pacific Division. I think almost every team was separated by, you know, three or four points, <laughs> almost every team in the division was separated by about three or four points uh, right around the time uh, at the stoppage. Uh, I exaggerate, but not by much um, at all. Um, are, were there, are there any positives to be drawn uh, from this stoppage, whether it be preparation, whether it be uh, research and understanding certain teams, trends or whatnot, could any positives have been drawn maybe outside of rest uh, for the players um, and the rest from the day-to-day -day grind of being in the front office. Uh, could you draw any positives out of this stoppage? I, I absolutely would. Uh, we, I think we as a uh, hockey operations department, so the, the five or six of us in management, the pro scouting staff, the amateur scouting staff, uh, we were able to do a lot more stepping back and assessing how we identify players, how we gather background, how we incorporate more 
video into our scouting process, um, being more thorough and taking our time in building our uh, lists for free agency and for the draft. So I think we just built a lot more in the way of protocols and, and really raising the bar uh, over the course of this time because we had it. Like In my opinion, rather than have the scouts see one more month of games, the ability to go back and really check their own work uh, through video and through phone calls and research, I thought was a terrific and perhaps even better means of using their time. Uh, the coaches, I think, were able to step back and look at our team, look at what we did well and not well, and and really have a second shot at training camp because we'll have a full training camp coming up. So if we have areas we, we want to improve in the way that we defend or play offensively or or create on the power play, we have a chance to begin anew. And to your point, with players who are all healthy, uh, who aren't worn down, now they'll be a little bit rusty, but they should have a lot in the tank to give over the couple of months that we have coming up. Um, and it's funny to say it, but I think our communication has been better due to COVID just as a, as a whole hockey operation because you're not focused on what's right in front of you in the rink. You have to plan meetings. You have to have more calls. Uh, you know, I started FaceTiming with people on our staff who I wouldn't have talked to a ton before because they were out in the field. So I think our relationships and our communication have become better as a result of all this. Once again, Chris Snow, Assistant General Manager of the Calgary Flames, joining us on the A Lot of Sports Talk podcast. Uh, it's so interesting hearing you talk about uh, using front office jargon and talking as someone uh, in the front office because our time together in college and immediately uh, after college was talking about Reporting, talking about sports in a way that uh, uh, would befit us as journalists. And you were a journalist. And I'm sure that journalist bug never stops biting. Uh, right out of college, uh, you uh, went to the Minneapolis Star Tribune, uh, covered the Wild, and I believe covered other teams and uh, sports in Minnesota. Then, uh, what, right around when you were 24 or 25, or even before that, uh, uh, became the beat writer for the Boston Red Sox uh, for the Boston Globe, uh, which uh, made a lot of people um, and colleagues of yours at the Daily Orange proud, um, maybe a little, maybe a little jealous too. Okay, <laughs> so um, but no, we were unbelievably proud of you, of course. Um, but after that, you ended up going from journalism uh, to the front office. Um, how were you able to, I guess, break down that wall uh, since in some circles uh, there is somewhat of a maybe of a distrust, mistrust between front office types and media types, okay, with information they want to, you know, give out or not in terms of the front office. How did you break that sure. wall down to go from being a journalist uh, to being a member of the front office, and uh, why did you want to do that? Good question. The latter part is question why. Uh, well, I think that any any job that anyone anyone gets is really rooted in a relationship, right? That there is someone doing the hiring who has a, a bit of a relationship and belief in the ability of someone to come in and help. So in my case, the first job I had, as you mentioned, out of school, was covering the Minnesota Wild for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. And for whatever reason, the, the GM and I, Doug Risefrow, we just got along really well. Uh, he had played for the Montreal Canadiens in the 1970s when they won, I believe, four cups. And my dad was a Bruins fan, and every year, Montreal beat Boston, and so the agony and the knowledge of what that, that team did to the Bruins was, was fresh for me because my dad taught me that growing up. So I had this, I think, inherent respect and curiosity for Doug and for Jacques Lemaire, who was a teammate of his who coached that wild team, and, and a couple of others who were part of both, both franchises, Montreal in the 70s and, and Minnesota in the 2000s. And so Doug and I just kept up a relationship when I went back to Boston to cover the Red Sox in 2005 and six, and that's when Theo Epstein was running the team and they had just won the World Series for the first time in 86 years. And so D Doug was really curious about that. He's curious by nature and he was looking for somebody who would come in and apply some of that inquisitiveness and forward thinking and, 
I didn't have the qualifications in the way of an analytical background or the, the typical idea of someone who would be a change agent for a professional sports team in the front office. But what, what he liked, I think, was I was curious. I was um, organized with information. I could communicate. And he liked that I was a total outsider, that I could come in and ask uncomfortable questions. And I asked lots, and I'm not sure they were always that popular. Um, but he wanted that, and he loved that. And he, I, I got an education, I think, those initial years more than I gave to the team because I had no background in it. Uh, but he was a very, very willing teacher and really created the foundation for what I have today. Uh, before I go forward with the next question, I have a couple more questions before you go. Uh, a shout out from uh, Matt Lochner, uh, fellow Brew Niner. Okay, yes, our yes. dorm uh, room, Brewster Boland Hall, Brew Nine, our floor. Okay, so yeah, yeah Brew Nine, he gives you a shout out um, on our <laughs> Facebook live stream. So, well, hey there. <laughs> right, yes. Uh, so, um, you, I do have to mention because you mentioned the alliance that you made with former Montreal Canadiens, you are a Massachusetts native, and you said your dad is a big, was a big Boston Bruins fan, and for those who are not in the know, uh, the Montreal-Boston rivalry is a real thing, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yes, there is um, animosity uh, between Montreal uh, and Boston, so to hear about the kind of... Um, almost unholy alliance, okay, that you made with uh, former Canadians uh, uh, is so uh, interesting. Uh, so, yeah, uh, now being in the front office uh, for the Calgary Flames and representing the Calgary Flames, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, arguably the greatest Calgary Flame, Jerome McGinley, uh, was uh, officially uh, uh, named to be a part of the next uh, Hockey Hall of Fame class. And Joe McGinley, uh, a black athlete, and will be the fourth uh, black person to be inducted into uh, the Hockey Hall of Fame. And uh, his talent is was and is immeasurable. Um, on the same side of the coin, uh, uh, there was a tweet last year uh, from a former uh, member of the Calgary Flames, uh, Akeem Alou, uh, who talked about uh, the uh, racial abuse and abuse that he uh, suffered uh, in the minors at the hands of uh, a person who, uh, up until this past November, was the head coach uh, of the Calgary Flames, uh, Bill Peters. Um, given those two uh, stories, um, where do you think the National Hockey League and maybe the Flames specifically might need to continue to improve to uh, help a lot of the perception uh, that people might have of the National Hockey League being kind of an all boys club or all white boys club um, in terms of helping include and having the league be even more inclusive than it has been. And they've uh, the league has made strides in that. But where do you think uh, the National Hockey League and the Flames, maybe specifically, uh, what needs to continue to happen, especially now with uh, uh, the current climate that we're in uh, after uh, the past couple of months uh, uh, off of uh, what had happened, what has happened here in America with the uh, 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 police brutality costing the lives of Black people? Uh, where do you think the National Hockey League? Uh, what steps does the National Hockey League need to continue to take to kind of improve its inclusivity um, and its diversity? Sure, that's it's a really good question. Uh, and Jerome McGinley, for starters, is as good of a person as I have ever met in the game of hockey. Uh, my first year here, uh, my son was four or five months old when Christmas came around, and I went over to Craig Conroy, one of our other assistant GMs, his, ho his uh, house on Christmas Eve. And Jerome was there with his wife and his three kids. And Jerome and I both went out to start up our cars at the same time because it was freezing out. And Jerome turned to me and said, hey, so I know that you guys aren't from here and don't have any family. And if you want to come over for Christmas dinner tomorrow, you're more than welcome to. And I was like, oh, I wish we didn't have plans. <laughs> and so <laughs> we, uh, we didn't go and couldn't go. But that speaks to Jerome, uh, the person who is every bit as impressive as Jerome, the player. Um, 
you know, one of the challenges I think for the league in, in terms of what you're talking about is there just aren't a lot of black players. And what was great with Jerome was I think he was a role model um, to black kids who said, I want to be a hockey player. Because I imagine, I can't relate to it, but I imagine that if you can't see people who look like yourself doing something, then it's hard to see yourself doing that. Um, I, I do think that the league has worked really hard uh, with Willie O'Ree and through other avenues uh, in an attempt to create more access to the sport um, for kids who are black who wouldn't normally play. Um, you know, hockey is a game that that if you don't get in young, it's, you know, there's so much to the coordination of skating and playing and doing all those things that it's not a sport kids tend to join late. So I think the greatest thing we can do is, is A, make the sport more accessible um, to black kids to play um, so that they feel like it is a place where they can go to develop athletically and make friends and, and do that. Um, but then as a, as a league to, to really respect and participate in this movement right now. Uh, the players who have spoken out, um, Tyler Sagan, for example, in Dallas, to see him in a march and tweeting the things he said, I was really, really impressed by that. Um, and, and hopefully, and this goes for every citizen in, in the U.S., in Canada, anywhere, um, that this, this is a moment that we don't sort of let pass by without trying to somehow educate ourselves as to what it feels like to be a black person in America. Um, and, and, and how to do that can be hard for people. You know, if you're me and I live in Canada and most people who live around me are white, it's not right in your face what the experience of a black person is. So it means reading, it means connecting with people you know, people like yourself and asking questions um, that we normally wouldn't ask, having open, honest conversations to understand a viewpoint. And I think that takes actively seeking it out um, because for a lot of us, again, like I said, where I live, uh, uh, if I don't seek it out, I won't be educated on my own. Uh, and definitely know that I'm a person who uh, you can reach out to at any time um, outside of the almost 20 years that we haven't uh, been well, in contact. I can, up, right. I, can, I can pick up the phone and it'll be like uh, 20 years haven't passed, 20 minutes have passed, which is awesome. Yes. Uh, I'm going to get you out on this. Um, <laughs> many athletes uh extol the virtues of their better halves uh, uh because of the travel and the sacrifices that they have to make uh with you know picking up and leaving and going to all many all these different places with uh the players uh, who are traded or go to these different places and all the sacrifices that wives and girlfriends and uh better halves make uh sure. for the family uh, kelsey um i am sure is uh an angel on earth I am so sure of that. Um, I just want to uh, know more about uh, what she has done and everything that she has been able to do in terms of support uh, through uh, what you've gone through the past uh, year, year and a half, what uh, your career since you've left Syracuse, uh, when you've met Kelsey, who I believe was at one point a fellow reporter uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so just uh, describe uh, what Kelsey has meant uh, to your life, to your career, to uh, the past year and in a half and just uh, the type of person that uh, that she is yeah, she, she has meant everything to me through this uh, we met at the Boston Globe in the summer of 05 she was an intern that summer from uh, the University of Kansas lived in South Dakota grew up there and so I you know never ever ever would have met her if not for that internship how many through. how many times have you said rock chalk Jayhawk <laughs> I've been there one time for a game and it is like a eerie low neat kind of sound that they make when they do that um and, and what has been really great is she she's a storyteller and when she is passionate about a subject she is an incredible storyteller so to have her walk through this with me and tell my story on her blog uh, which is kelseysnowrights.com has been um, it's, it's been terrific for so many reasons. For, for one reason, it's been a way to give, you know, globally to give hope to people 
uh, with this disease. Um, I think it's inspired people who are not sick to have and live a better day because they have a window into something very raw and difficult. And I think it's allowed her and, and me a means of communicating directly. So on Twitter, and on Facebook, with people who do know us and will see us on a daily basis and we can get out ahead of their questions. We can, we can give them our viewpoint so that they treat us the way we want to be treated. Uh, they don't have as many questions. It's been less emotionally taxing because we don't have to talk about everything with everybody. We can do it through her blog when there's an update on my health or whether there is an experience we had that just lends itself to writing. She doesn't plan to write the moment it strikes her and then she just sits down and starts to write. And, and the, the support she's offered me in the way of asking questions to the doctors and filtering information to me and researching and filtering. I, I have not had to dive into those areas where I have a lot of fear of the answer. She's done it for me. And so the, the strength and the happiness she brings me every day and that she brings our kids at a time like this is amazing. Like she's just buoyant. She's so happy in the face of this that, um, you know, it motivates me to be there for her for a very, very long time. Uh, thank you so very much for uh, sharing uh, a little bit more about the person that uh, Kelsey Snow is. And uh, let me be the last person uh, to congratulate you and Kelsey on your marriage and your two children. <laughs> okay, the absolute last person. <laughs> All right, yes. Uh, for more information on Chris Snow and to also possibly donate uh, to fundraise uh, for ALS, uh, it is you can go to calgaryflames.com slash snowy strong snowy s n o w y strong uh this is the first time that i know that you go by snowy <laughs> okay it's thing everybody's name is converted to that. <laughs> yes if your last name we might call you coiks or something but, uh, <laughs> so they would take out the e part all right That's since i already go with what it is. yeah have it grandfathered <laughs> in all right so i have to have it removed <laughs> okay yes and uh please uh if you have some sort of uh trick uh, that you want to possibly perform on Twitter, uh, please do so. Uh, and put the hashtag trickshot for the number four snowy trickshot for snowy. And you can see Chris Snow nailing a 43 yard fuel goal uh, from last June. Not his personal best that I can officially <laughs> attest. Uh, yes, <laughs> close, but not. Uh, but you had room to spare on that 43 yard field goal, right? I think we did. It's hard to tell from the camera angle, but I was thinking, oh, I wish I was back a few yards. <laughs> See? All right. So, again, he is a free agent place kicker, but he also <laughs> is the assistant general manager of the Calgary Flames and one of the most dynamic and wonderful people I've ever met. I am so thankful uh, that I got a chance to meet you on the first day that I stepped on campus at Syracuse University that you were my RA uh, in August of 2000. And I'm so thankful that 20 years later uh, that we are able and have uh, this conversation. And we will have another conversation. Well, at least one more in 2040 since we made that official. Right. Okay, oh, yes, uh, yes. Chris Snow of the Calgary Flames, Assistant General Manager. Thank you so very much uh, for joining us. Best of luck and success to you and the Flames, and more importantly to you and your wife and your two children. Uh, you are just a beacon of light, and I'm so thankful that you uh, took some time out of your busy life uh, to talk to us. So, Chris, thank you so very much for the time. Edesina, it's my pleasure. You were an indelible part of my time at Syracuse, and uh, you are outstanding at what you're doing here and uh, it's my honor and pleasure to do it i would do this anytime for you thank you and officially after that comment your check is in the mail <laughs> okay <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> right. yes okay <laughs>